Welcome to the Golf Improvement Podcast, Episode 16. Welcome to the podcast for golf lovers and enthusiasts who are looking to take their games to new heights. Dedicated to custom club fitting, short game improvement, and effective practice to improve your golf game. This is the Golf Improvement Podcast with your host, Tony Wright. Hello, this is Tony Wright from Game Improvement Golf in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, with the Golf Improvement Podcast, dedicated to bringing you useful information on custom club fitting, short game improvement, and effective practice techniques to take your game to new heights. Well, we got back from Rochester, New York, uh, on on our annual Thanksgiving trip late last night, and so wasn't able to get my podcast up and running on Monday like I usually do, but it's Tuesday and here we are getting it going. This morning, Tuesday morning, I woke up and there was a message in my inbox from LinkedIn saying, giving me the opportunity to say congrats to Scott Stallings, who is uh, the local PGA pro. Well, he's a PGA pro who has played out of our club, the Oak Ridge Country Club in Oak Ridge has three PGA Tour wins, and it's uh, he's celebrating his fourth year on the PGA Tour. Quite, a, quite an accomplishment. And so far this year, Scott has had a couple good tournaments, and it looks like he's going to have a great year. At least I'm hoping he will. So I did send those congrats to him. But I will say that after I, after I got that message, I thought a little bit and realized that this November, it's been eight years since I've had my club fitting business started. So I'm very thankful for that, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to continue to to work with golfers to help them truly improve their games. One of the things I remembered as I was thinking about that this morning is that Keith Chatham, who's one of the Master uh, Association of Golf Club Fitting Professionals, fitters, a good friend, and somebody who helps us all out a lot, once said, or at least I remember him saying, that for many people it takes at least seven years or so to really get yourself to the point where you know enough to be a great club fitter. And as I contemplate that, I know I've said this a few times in some of my uh, blog posts, but I am very, very thankful right now for the Association of Golf Club Fitting Professionals, of which I've been a member for about seven years, I believe. I think I've attended now uh, at least seven, maybe eight of the annual roundtables, and we're already looking forward to the next one. What's really unique about the AGCP is that we have an online forum that's organized through what uh, Roy Nix, the founder of AGCP, calls the Mastermind Group Principle. And the basis of that Mastermind Group Principle is there are no dumb questions. Every question is relevant. Every question is important. There aren't personal attacks on people when people respond to it. So as a result, we have a really rich learning environment on that online forum. And I can truthfully say that every day there's something that comes through the forum that is of interest and often something where I'll learn something new that I hadn't known before that helps me be a better club fitter, helps me organize my business better, things like that. So today, uh, after eight years of being a, 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 a club fitter, a professional club fitter, and continuing to enjoy every day of it, I want to say a personal thanks to the Association of Golf Club Fitting Professionals and all the people in it who each and every day are really dedicated to helping each one of us be better at what we do, and as a result, helping golfers be better at playing golf. So thanks to the AGCP and I will also put a, uh, a note in the show notes today that's a link to the AGCP locator. Uh, of course, if you're in my area and you want to come see me for advice on golf clubs and club fitting, I'm more than welcome to help you. But if you're listening to this podcast and are in another area of the United States, you can look on this locator and find someone who's close to you, and you will never regret doing this. They are a source of great knowledge and they are dedicating to helping golfers play their best golf. So on to the interview with Bill Weitzel from Conquest Custom Golf. Taking your game to new heights, www.gameimprovementgolf.com. Hey 
Hello, this is Tony Wright with the Golf Improvement Podcast, and today I am uh, absolutely delighted to get to talk with Bill Weitzel from Conquest Custom Golf in Cincinnati, Ohio. I've uh, known Bill for, I think, six or seven years. i uh, learned an awful lot from him during that time. He's a Golf Digest Top 100 club fitter, and he recently went through the grinder a little bit and uh, became an Association of Golf Club Fitting Professionals Master Club Fitter. There are only, I believe, 12 of those right now, and it's something a lot of us aspire to. So, Bill, thanks for doing this with me today. Oh, my pleasure, Tony. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, that is great. Well, in fact, we've stopped, stopped at your shop once or twice on the way up, up north uh, during the fall, so it's, it's been fun to, to see your place. Uh, let's start out uh, talking a little bit about your story about how you got into custom club fitting. So well, over to you. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of an interesting situation. I, uh, I really didn't play a whole lot of golf until I, I was in my early 40s, believe it or not. I was one of those uh, three to four night a week softball guys from uh, graduating high school all the way up into my early 40s. And uh, I just got more and more interested in golf as I got a little older. And what really piqued my interest was I went out and spent a fortune on a driver and irons, etc. And speaking specifically about a driver, I noticed how I would have two different 10 degree heads. They both would say stiff flex on the shaft. And then I would actually hit them in the local retailers, but they would feel so different. And this was back when golf equipment, I mean, a, a, a new driver was $499 yeah. guaranteed every time. <laughs> and irons were 11, 1200 bucks, uh, you know, uh, and I immediately with my restaurant background, I was looking to try to find an equal product that didn't cost me as much. And so I'm fishing around online and I stumbled across a website called Golfsmith and I saw a discontinued snake eyes with a free shaft and grip for like fifty nine ninety nine, <laughs> and a little epoxy packet and uh, videos on how to basically build a golf club. So I spent about after shipping and everything, maybe 75 bucks, bought a little hacksaw to cut the graphite shaft, et cetera, et cetera. And I glued up my first driver, went out and just beat the living daylights out of that thing and performed as good, if not better than my $500 Callaway driver that I was playing at the time. Yeah. And, and it was a bit of an eye opener because all I saw was $500, $75, same results. Yeah. And it just kind of blossomed from there. I started digging in and it was about a year later that I stumbled across the professional club makers society and they were only two hours away in Louisville to boot. And it was right before one of their expos. So I went down there, uh, totally bug eyed. And I, it was like that, good deer in the headlights look and i was just in heaven and it just snowballed from there it went from a, a hobby to a passion to a career in a matter of about four or five years yeah, yeah. uh there's so many people i think that you know get into it from the basis of you know having a club and then finding out you know why isn't this doing what i really think it ought to be doing right Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, it was a real eye opener. Well, one of the things, you know, we talked about, obviously I was there when you got to become a master and, and you created some notes for me before. I mean, I would just let the people know, but about the questions, but you talked about one of the things that's really important about club fitting is, uh, and becoming a master is what do you do when things don't go as planned? I just was so fascinated by that comment. So can you talk just a few minutes about that and, and how important that is in terms of, you know, being a really good club fitter? Because you see a lot of different people, right? Oh, absolutely. I, I do a couple of hundred fittings. I, I think 200 might be a stretch, but pushing 200 fittings a year, I would say, at least 100 and a half. Well, I would say it, it, if somebody, if things aren't going as planned, I, I assume it's you're getting into the fitting and you pretty much have a general starting routine, if you will. Yeah. And you know, things just aren't blossoming quite, quite the way you think they would. Well, it's, it's, it's not really that difficult. It's kind of a, a logic of go, no go. You do what you normally would do to attain a certain result. And if it isn't happening, then you have to start thinking outside the box. And, and I'll give you a, here's a perfect example. And it just happened about a month ago. 
I had heard from another club fitter that one of the ways to reduce a guy's spin, if a guy's spin needs to come down with, with a driver fitting in particular, is to go to a little bit stiffer tip section, or excuse me, midsection on the shaft. I've never tried that. And I had a gentleman recently that, uh, very good ball striker, single digit handicapper. Uh, I was getting the overall results that I wanted, except that even though his impacts were fairly decent, meaning center to high center on the face, I still thought his spin was a little bit high. Now I generally don't fit for spin too much. Yeah. Because that is so heavily influenced by the loft of the club and the angle of attack. Well, this guy was hitting a nine degree club, and I tell you, he, all, in all honesty, needed probably close to a seven, seven and a half. I mean, this guy had a nice upward angle of attack. He was catching it mid high center, uh, and and I just thought his spin was a little bit too high. And I remembered another club fitter telling me one time that uh, if you strengthen the center of the shaft just a little bit, or you know, you look for a shaft with that profile, yeah. a lot of times spin will come down. Well, I did that. I started playing around with uh, some of the shafts that I knew had a slightly stiffer midsection and son of a gun. I watched the spin drop uh, five, 600 RPMs right now, one after another. My so goodness, really, yeah. it's just knowing which way to go. And, and, and if it doesn't work, you have to know what your options are. You know, can it, is it a length adjustment, a weight adjustment, a shaft profile change? You know, and, and the big key is to just change one variable at a time. Don't change more than one, because if you do, you're not you don't know which variable gave you the positive or the negative effect that you're looking for. So you didn't realize you really should have been a scientist, huh? <laughs> Instead of in, in the. <laughs> yeah, boy, but that's no what they do, right? Yeah, I'm the industrial engineer that never got out of the food business. Yeah. Wow. Well, well, Bill, talk, if you will, for a while about some of the, you know, let's say the top three to five areas of club fitting that you ha th see having the biggest payoff in terms of uh, golfers improving their performance. Oh, sure. Absolutely. I think hands down shaft profiling uh, probably is in the top two, meaning knowing the different profiles of the shafts and, and what they will do for you and how to use them. And for those that aren't familiar with shaft profiling, I'm referring to butt stiff, tip soft, butt soft, tip stiff, or stiff all the way down, yeah. and how it's going to impact uh, most golfers and, and knowing how to utilize that. Hands down to me, uh, the, the lower third of the shaft with, with woods or irons is, is the key. Uh, you can be off just a little bit in the butt section, in my opinion. Uh, the midsection, same way, but if that tip section is wrong, you're 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 SOL nine times out of ten. Yeah. I believe Mike McFadden even made a statement uh, on our forum a week or so ago. Uh, made a comment about he doesn't even fit for flex a whole lot. I mean, meaning it can be off a little bit. He's more focused on length, weight, the balance of the club, etc. And, and that's I think I kind of feel the same way. Uh, you know, the flex can be off a little bit because when you're measuring flex. You're only measuring the, the butt section anyway. That can be off a little bit yeah. and, and nothing earth shattering. Uh, the second thing, and this is something Roy Nix beat into our heads from day one, uh, the relationship of the face angle uh, to the club path at impact. What a huge, huge thing. If you can dial that in, at least get the golfer hitting the ball straight. And I didn't say straight down the middle. Yeah, I'm right. Hitting yeah. the ball straight. If you can get that accomplished, for, uh, you, you've really done a lot. And, and that's easily done with uh, weight adjustments and length adjustments is what I have found. Uh, I think anything. So you're it, saying length adjustments in terms of uh, adjusting well, the a, MOI or the swing weight some, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. well, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, a, a shorter club has a, has a smaller arc, makes it easier to turn it over. I mean, a guy that's uh, struggling to – shut the club head down. I mean, I'm going to look at his grip and I don't play with the swing too terribly much. I don't think I'm qualified to do that. Uh, I look at it, of course, and I've learned a lot over the years, but, uh, you know, if you got a shorter club, the arc is smaller, the club feels lighter. It's generally easier to shut down. I mean, I, I don't add any additional weight to the head. Yeah. And, and if you go to maybe just shorten a club a quarter inch or a half inch, uh, it can make all the difference in the world. I just did it with a really tall guy last week. Uh, his clubs were about an inch and three quarter over what I will call standard. And I just 
my instincts told me, let's just go a little bit shorter. And I just, just dropped a quarter inch. And the MOI of his club and the club that I had in his hand was the same. And I, I immediately had center face impacts. All it took was that slightly shorter length and the club became manageable to him. So I think that's huge. Uh, I like to emphasize to golfers that I am not qualified to teach the golf swing. However, doing what we do for a living here, you have to understand what I call cause and effect in the golf swing to be a good fitter, in my opinion. And But I make it very clear to my customers, I do not teach the swing. I'm not qualified to do that. I understand how the swing and the equipment that you're using are related, and that's where I come in. But, uh, you know, any swing issues, you I can show you what's wrong, but usually you're going to need a PGA professional to try to fix that. Yeah. It's down. Uh, in that same breath, I'll also tell a customer that, you know, I don't fit and build magic golf clubs. Uh, it just doesn't happen. Getting fitted by a, a fitting professional as yourself and myself as well, uh, you're, you're going to get better results the majority of the time, but you can still put a bad swing on a perfectly fitted club. And jokingly, but in all honesty, <laughs> I, I do it on a regular basis. <laughs> I am not the greatest golfer in the world because I play once a week. I don't have time for lessons. I, guys come in my shop, see this great facility, and then I tell them, guess what? In four years, I've hit balls here maybe five times in four years in my current location. I just don't have time. And it's a good problem to have. Oh, yeah. You know, That's no right. doubt. And, and then another thing I always like to point out to golfers, and this is a, during the interview process at the beginning, is that a lot of guys come in looking for a, a certain amount of improvement. And I like to emphasize with them that really your degree of improvement is more predicated on how bad is your existing equipment. Because what if the guy's equipment is, is almost perfect for him? I'd say 20% of the people that come through my door are leaving with the sticks they own by my recommendation, because I'll tell them, you know, like, Hey, you know, this is not far off. If you want a second set and keep your old sticks as maybe a travel set, I said, but what I'm going to put in your hands is really close to what you have now. Yeah. And, and, and golfers are real appreciative of that because my, some of my biggest and best referrals have come from golfers that have been fitted by me that did not get equipment from me at my recommendation. Because I, I think I've built a reputation of brutal honesty. Uh, you know, if a guy doesn't need sticks, I'll be the first one to tell him, and they love me for it. Yeah. You know? So yeah. Uh, it, it matters. The the face angle and uh, <laughs> and club path stuff, like you said, it 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 is so huge, and uh, it, it it makes an incredible difference. I just learning more and more about that all the time as you see more and more people. So. Oh, I'm, I'm with you all the way. And, and that's where head forgiveness comes in. Yeah. You know, if you, cause I, unless you're an extremely consistent single digit handicapper hitting center of the face on most of your shots, I don't see that a whole lot and yeah. I'll, I'll get drastic improvements with golfers, but you know, they can still put a bad swing on it. Oh yeah. Well, Bill talk a little bit. And those were really five great, great areas that I, that, that you described that you, that, that you focus on, um, uh, based on, you know, a lot of experience. Um, talk about some of your most satisfying, um, you know, sort of success stories with some of the golfers you've worked with. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I remember one in particular, it was one of my first, what I will call biggest success stories. And this was when my shop was located at a local driving range. And I had a gentleman come in, he was in his late seventies easily. And, you know, he just, he was just looking for more distance. He hit the ball fairly straight and I, it's, we've all had this happen, I'm sure, but I can put numbers to this one, but this guy came through the door with a 10 and a half degree Cleveland driver with an Audela NV 65 gram stiff flex shaft. Oh, and this guy, this guy could barely generate, you know, high 60 mile an hour club head speed. I mean, you know, he, he yeah. just caught up with him. I mean, he's hitting the ball, uh, you know, 145, 150 yards. He can barely get it off the ground. And, uh, I, I mean, I knew I was going to be a hero right away. And there's a yeah. class, that's a classic example of what I just said earlier about it. Real the degree of improvement is more predicated on the equipment the golfer has. Yeah. This guy, when I was done with him, 
I mean, he was hitting 200 yard drives. That's my <laughs> record for, for a driver was basically a 55 yard improvement with this guy. And here's the kicker. I used the same head. Yeah. This guy was yeah. hitting center, high center. His launch angle, angle of attack was great. That shaft was just, and, and you know, I mean, that old NV65 stiff is practically an extra stiff shaft. Yeah. And he yeah. just couldn't do it. But I put the right shaft in his hand at the right length. He maintained the impact conditions that he had. But now he had a shaft that was working for him. The ball got up in the air. Same loft, same head. But it got up in the air. The roll was where it needed to be. And he was 55 yards longer. And, and by the way, those numbers of 55 yards, this was back when uh, uh, you really couldn't track a whole lot of that kind of data. This was results he gave me about a month and a half later. He came into my shop to tell me that. And the gentleman had tears in his eyes. And it was one of the most rewarding fittings I've ever had was, was that gentleman. Because golf, using his words, golf was fun again. And to take a guy 78 years old who had been struggling for a decade plus and all of a sudden the sport is fun again it, it, it was so rewarding and he gets to play senior tees you know and he plays <laughs> with his buddies and he comes out the next day and they say what the heck happened boy you talk about a, a, a great referral right <laughs> oh I, well, i'll tell you another one is i had a gentleman come up from uh, key west florida probably my single longest traveler and he now in, in defense of that statement he he resided in columbus Ohio for a long, long time. He was a retired, uh, I believe, COO of uh, of uh, oh, what's the big uh, Macy's that that organization, the Limited. Yeah. That's what it yeah. was. He come up and he was up. He came down to Cincinnati. He was up in Columbus, uh, you know, for a, a summertime. Uh, he stays up there in the summertime, and he come down and he just wanted to uh, beat his buddy. I thought his name was was. Uh, Bob, I believe his buddy, or Bob was the golfer. I'm sorry. His buddy yeah. was, was Frank. I think it was, he just said he had to beat Frank. He had to beat Frank. And, and when he left, he was hitting the, his irons longer and straighter. Uh, no doubt about it. And within six weeks, I get an email from him and he's beating his buddy. I think it was Frank, if I recall. Well, it wasn't, but two weeks after that, I get a phone call from some guy named Frank. In <laughs> <West> Florida. Yes, <laughs> and I don't know what the heck you did to Bob, but I'm coming to see you. <laughs> and, and, and that became a fun, fun situation. Yeah, uh, I, I'll tell you. Here's another good one I had was a, a gentleman uh, early '60s. He he was a dentist. He was a very tall, lanky guy, and he oh every bit of a 15 yard slice with his six iron. And it, he just looked really labored. He was playing dynamic gold S three hundreds at about two inches over standard, very heavy club. And he didn't have the uh, highest swing speed in the world. I, I seem to recall below eighties, something like that. Uh, he loaded the club fairly well, but the, there was just too much club there. And I, I knew it at square one and, and I nailed it on the first try. And I'll never forget it. I gave my head with just a little bit more offset. Yeah. Uh, I don't, yeah. it was a wish on, I don't recall off the top of my head. Uh, but I put an 80 gram aerotech in his hands and his very first shot was a beautiful baby draw. And it was 20 yards longer than all his averages with his existing club. And that was his first shot. And I'm thinking, okay, fluke, he proceeded to stripe about five more right down the middle, 20 to 22 yards longer consistently and he was just grinning ear to ear. Now, that's probably my single best uh, uh, iron improvement. But if I, if I had to give you averages, I would say the average driver is 10, 12 yards longer, with in, including increased roll, yeah. uh, but yeah. the club feels better. Irons, almost consistently at least a half a club longer and definitely hitting the ball straighter. And the, the, the intangible that we can't see with a launch monitor is feel. I get golfers all the time that just are blown away about, about how good a club feels. And uh, I think maybe the last one that was a big success story, and this was just about a month ago also, I had a gentleman that tells me on the phone that he uh, has 120 mile an hour club head speed, hits the ball uh, 290, 300, you know, consistently, da 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 da. And he comes in, and guys, he's in his early 40s, but he's in unbelievable physical condition and he's i think a seven handicap something like that and when he starts off he, he's hitting the ball about 290 295 something like that 
but he's spraying it around about 15 yards right, 15 yards left. And his objective was to see which one of his three shafts were the optimal fit for him. He had a Titleist, I believe, 913, if I recall. Yeah. yeah. And he's got like an Audel, a Rogue, and a couple of Obons. And he's just going after this thing. And after about 15, 20 shots, now he's carrying the ball about 265 to 275. He's still spraying it everywhere. And uh, I believe you have a flight scope like I do, but you right, can see right. the acceleration and speed profiles. The lines are all over the place, which t- what, what I've learned how to use with, the, with those graphs. What I've learned is if you have the profile and the overall weight of the club correct and the, and the stiffness of the club, those lines just start falling on top of each other. And he's all over the place. And I knew right away that all these shafts were just too stiff for him, even though they were extra stiff shafts. Oh, and by the way, his club head speed was averaging 108 to 112. He would step on it, get up to about 117. He did hit 120 one time. Yeah. So it was yeah. the proverbial high club head speed. Is He's not swinging it quite as hard as he thought he was. But anyway, uh, uh, I put an Acura shaft in his hands to start. And uh, he, he, he liked the feel of it, but just – it just maybe wasn't quite right. It, it was definitely better. Uh, the, the lines and the profiles were where they needed to be. I mean, it was a huge difference from the other clubs, but there was no real big difference in performance. He was kind of spraying it around. And I got him hitting a 919, by the way. Well, finally, I get to the very end, and uh, this gentleman's an attorney. You know, he can afford a high-dollar shaft. But uh, I told him, I said, you know, I want to try one more shaft option. I said, I just think we can do better. I said, but there's something different, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. And what I did is I had a a Washon 85-gram X-Flex that I had on hand for fairway usage uh, for a guy that swings pretty hard for fairway fairway woods. And I I stuck that baby into the 919, and I'll cut to the chase on what was different. Uh, He was swinging – his club was 45 and three eighths inch all the way down the board. And he's a pretty good ball striker, but he's around the face a little bit. But uh, I put that 44 inch club in his hands and this X flex shaft, and he just proceeded to strike five in a row, three yards left or right of center. His very first shot was a carry at 298, and he averaged about 305 to 310, four or five in a row right now. <laughs> it was immediate. And he just turned around, big grin on his face, walks toward me, he extends a handshake, and he said, sir, you have earned your paycheck today. <laughs> <laughs> and what a great feeling that was. And needless to say, an iron fitting was booked right behind that. And uh, yeah. the rest is history, as they say. Oh, uh, great great set of stories. Story. Oh, it's fun. There, there's more, but those are the ones that stand out in my mind. Yeah. yeah. Well, Bill, at, at the end here uh, – Let's have you sort of come back and talk about a, just a, a few things that you think are really important in terms of golfers should understand about club fitting and and how they should approach it. I, I think one of the biggest things, really, first and foremost, is you got to get it through these guys' heads that you know we do not make magic golf clubs. I, I alluded to that earlier, and I, I emphasize that you can still put a bad swing on a perfectly fitted club. What you'll find, though, is the percentage of bad swings tends to reduce, and some more dramatically than others. But you're not going to go out and hit everything right down the middle every time, 5, 10, 15, 25 yards longer. You're not going to take 10 or 15 strokes off your cap. Uh, I I still, to this day, see those magic numbers I was taught years ago. A two- to six-stroke improvement after being fitted is – generally an average with a mid to high capper and with a single digit capper it, it's zero to two maybe three strokes at the most yeah, uh yeah. but but the feel of the club uh is is really paramount with guys at that skill level and that's where you'll see a big difference so when clubs feel good to any golfer but especially a low digit uh handicapper i i that good things tend to happen. So I, I think first getting them to understand that the, the clubs aren't magic. They're just, we're giving them the right tools for the job, you know, and, and we've all got these different analogies. And one of the ones I came up with years ago was I equate golf club fitting to like being a roofer. Uh, I, we take the hammer out of their hands and we give them a nail gun. One <laughs> is way more efficient than the other. However, 
if you point the nail gun at the sky, the roof doesn't go on. And, and I think what we do relates to that quite well because, you know, you can get the right tools in the guy's hands, but he still has the responsibility to put a proper swing on the club. It's just that it's a whole lot easier if the club fits them. And, and I think that's one of the biggest things that, that I can stress to them uh, more than anything else. Uh, another thing is uh, so many guys have, have been brainwashed by mass media and big retailers on what a fitting is. And I hear it all the time that when a guy goes through a fitting with me, the difference between that and a local retailer or a local pro shop is night and day. I mean, it's so much more in depth. Uh, you know, I explain to the golfer what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. I know a lot of guys when they perform fittings, they don't talk a lot. I mean, they don't tell the golfer what's in their head, but I, I want the golfer to know I want to go to this shaft because X, Y, Z, or I want to use this head because of X, Y, Z. And I want them to understand that because one of the best compliments I get routinely is a golfer will see me three to six months later for whatever reason. And they'll tell, they'll thank me for being so verbally detailed in the fitting because let's just say it's an iron fitting for an irons, for example, Assuming the golfer's in the fairway because he's te- after he's teed off, the kind of comments I'll hear regularly is that their confidence is higher when they approach that ball line in the fairway for their uh, shots of the green because they know why that head was the best one for them, why this shaft at this length, at this kind of weighting is optimal for them. And it, it has a huge effect on confidence. And, and I think that's something I would love for golfers to understand that there's more to it than numbers. There, there's the mental side of the game. And when I can prove to you that these clubs are right for you, you know, I, I, it affects the confidence. And, and having confidence on the course is huge. Well, Bill, that's, uh, that's a great summary of, of uh, some things that, that, that people should know. And that confidence part is so huge. You're, you're right. Um, so those of you, particularly in the Cincinnati area, if you haven't seen Bill or you're interested – uh, it's Bill Weitzel at Conquest Custom Golf at www.conquestcustomgolf.com. And I think it's pretty obvious from the discussion that Bill is definitely one of those really talented people that's helping a lot of golfers. So, Bill, thanks for sharing your knowledge this morning with, you know, both some of us club fitters, but also with golfers who get to listen to this. I appreciate it, Tony. It was good talking to you. Very good. Well, Bill, have a good holiday. You too, my friend. Bye now. All right. See you. Bye-bye. Bill, thanks for that interview on custom club fitting and what you're doing to help golfers play their best. You're pretty humble about your accomplishments, but you truly deserve to be recognized as one of the top club fitters in the United States and as an AGCP master club fitter. Again, go to www.conquestcustomgolf.com to learn more about Bill Weitzel and what he does to help golfers play their best. Well, I'm pretty excited about the coming podcast in December. The next one is part two of my Master Club Fitting Club Fitter podcast series in which I'll talk with Dan Wilt from Link to the Links in Columbia, Tennessee. Dan is also a Golf Digest Top 100 fitter and recently became an AGCP master club fitter so see you in two weeks game improvement golf your source of information and inspiration to become an exceptional golfer now www.gameimprovementgolf.com